Um, welcome to our uh, Behind the Sound on Spinners. Um, thanks for coming. Um, my name's James. Uh, I'm going to be moderating this talk, and uh, I'll just introduce everyone here quickly. Uh, on the far left there is Kyle, who was the final mix engineer on the project, uh, Josh, who was the recording engineer on set, and then uh, Mr. Reddy D over here, who was the music supervisor and uh, master of all trades musical on the project. Um, yeah, so for those of you that don't know the project, we're just gonna quickly give a little view of the trailer just to um, give everybody a little bit of background about the show. Awesome, cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was an awesome collaboration between uh, Showmax and Canal Plus, as everybody heard from the co-production chat earlier. Um, but we want to focus on the collaboration on the audio side of things, um, from pre-production on set uh, through to music and to post-production, and how that all uh, added to the authenticity of this show from a sonic perspective. It was really um, important for us to uh, capture the unique sonic landscape that this uh, show represented. And um, I think uh, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. D. Um, with uh, Spinning Culture, you've got a big history there. Um, and. Um, its representation as a culture in the Cape Flats and uh, how it uh, was actually used back in apartheid, um, had like a lot of history there. Um, what was the part, the role of music in that history and culture and in spinning and how did you bring that to the show? Yeah, sure, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think with spinning, um, if you look at the culture, this series is as current as it gets at the moment. Something that not too many people know is that with youth culture, if you want to call it sort of more on a grassroots level, it's probably one of the biggest movements though. And it's not just in Cape Town City, but across the country as well. And it also has these effects across our borders as well. Mm. And we look at what's taking place in the US and all these other places, you know, um, we have a lot of um, people gravitating towards spinning in other countries around the world as well. But in South Africa, of course, it's more authentic. Mm. It's, got that, it's got that grit. It's got that, um, the, the attitude and there's a lot of force behind it and that's the way it has always been, you know, since the days of apartheid. In Cape Town City, we, we used to call it Papa Wheelie back then. I was a little young boy. I used to go to places like um, Stramfontein Pavilion. Then there was another place out in Athlone called Indiana. 
and through the dark days of apartheid, I think that is probably one of the greatest forms of defiance. Not even the cops could have break up the Papa Wheelie uh, gatherings. There was sometimes up to about a thousand to three thousand people right in the heart of apartheid. People going to buy the Gatsby's, the Salomis, whatever, and all these cars are busy spinning and popping the wheelies and all these things. The cops would rock up, but you're not going to move the people, you know. So mm. thinking about it on a deeper level, that's what it, uh, that's what it was. Was a, it was also an opportunity for people to come together socially as well. Mm. And I don't think that we ever knew that it would reach this point where people will actually be interested in turning it into a series mm. of big commercial brands would latch onto it because Red Bull's got something called Shine Motor right now. And this um, um, spinning battle, in other words, this has started to become an international property of such a huge company such as Red Bull. So the evolution and the growth of it is happening, you know, as we speak. So to see this being represented in this way mm. with a very strong storyline, for me, it's really cool. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to come on board with the project. Amazing, amazing. And I think uh, just while we're on the music, um, I think it's a show like this with uh, such a unique uh, local flavor has such a, is, is such a great opportunity um, to put musical artists on a platform to the world to show our music that's authentic to this culture, to the world. Um, can you talk a bit about the artists that you synced with the project and how, what your thinking was in um, placing these artists and I guess any challenges around that? <laughs> yeah, if you, sure. Be careful what you touch on there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was not an easy project. It was probably one of the most um, fun projects ever that I've worked on. But awesome. we had our work cut out for us and I'm sure the guys on the other side of the production <laughs> line, you probably had your work cut out as well. Mm. So when I was first approached by the French team, they broke down the story. The first thing they said, cause, I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> and then they said, okay, we want you to be involved with music, right? I'm in. And I thought it's as simple as that. Uh, we went back and forth. We had a couple of meetings and then Ben Hoffman and um, uh, jo 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 Joachim. Yeah, yeah. Joachim. They came to my house to listen to more than 40 beats. We were going through this listening um, session and they were like, tag this beat, tag that beat, tag this beat, tag that one. So in my head, I thought, okay, cool. This is the direction of the series musically. This is gonna be a, a walk in the park. And I thought my job is done. Mm. And then we got calls from the producer and they invited me on set to sit in on a few of the filming sessions. And after another few meetings, I realized, uh oh, this is not going as planned in my head though. And um, then they sent me some messages. D, we want you to get this artist, this artist, and this artist. And I'm like, okay, I could possibly get you A, B, C, and D, but if and everything else that's going to complete the alphabet, I know it's gonna be a tough one. And then they wanted some artists that were signed to major labels as well. Some of the guys don't live in South Africa anymore. Some people decided to go through a transition in their lives and they decided <laughs> I'm gonna go live in the mountain. I'm cutting myself off from Western civilization. <laughs> They've recorded music a good couple of years ago, so we had to try and find people that that's just non-existent anymore. They just decided I don't want to be around anymore. Um, I managed to find a, a few of the guys and the ladies that decided to come on board, but then they just went off the radar again. So mm. It was those types of things. And then, you know, with some of the young artists, it's quite difficult to work with um, people that don't have the experience or the insight or they don't have the understanding. Mm. To kind of get them to understand the broader picture, how things work from an administrative side of point, mm. the legal side of things, how all of those things work. So that was a huge part of the, of the challenge. But what made it very exciting for me was the opportunity to, cre uh, to recreate some of the works that was on the wish list. Some of the artists we couldn't get hold of. And then I thought, guy, I'm just gonna step up, jump back in the booth, get down the boards, and I'm gonna start producing these tracks as close as I possibly can, but I still have to be very, very cautious mm. not to plagiarize, you know, mm. everything, note mm. for note, the melodies and all these things, mm. but at least you get the energy and you get the vibe, mm. you know, of what is required for the series. And you go behind the mic again, huh? Oh yeah. gosh, yeah, <laughs> I, even, I even had to rip out the microphone again and start nice. rapping again. Nice. I was like, oh my lord, and I was actually telling my wife um, on my way here, I told her I probably recorded the hardest hip hop song ever <laughs> in this, in this, that ever to be released in this country, if not the city. It is such a gritty, dirty, grimy, in your face. The thing just comes with 
Jay was beast balls, if I must think about it. It's, it's such a hard eating song, but it's really factual, you know. And also, um, going through the scripts and sitting in on some of the filming and, and, and understanding the direction. Because I grew up in Mitchell's Plain, I grew up on the Cape Flats, I've been in situations, you know, where guns were blazing. I've seen people shot in front of me. We had to run from the guns going off. Mm. I've seen many people laid out, you know, right in front of my mother's door. So I understand all of that. Mm. I understand all the tricky and challenging situations that, that, that pops up when people get rowdy and the crowds are, uh, you know, out of control. So a lot of that and some of the scenes here reminded me of those experiences. And when I think about it, I think of it in music and mm. I think of it in beats. And I'm already sitting and I'm mapping out the beats in my head. And I'm not sure what the outcome's gonna be, but I know this is the energy that was mm. needed. So that's kind of where we went. So the one, um, the one song is Vimaki Jofo. And that is like a, a little chant on the Cape Flats. Vimaki Jofo, Os Maki Jofo. And I'm shaking, okay, the youth, they're into this trap and this new drill sound. That's like the new school vibe. So how do I take this dark, heavy, edgy character? But I had to shape the way that I rapped on the song as if I am a gangbanger slash guy in prison. That's not really a hip hop head. Mm. And I had to structure the way that I rap and I'm writing the lyrics and I'm creating the flow as somebody that can't really rap. Mm. But you wanted to say something over this beat. So it's kind of creating all those touch points and those connecting points mm. as well. So there's like parts of like, it's a ziggy ziggy zasak salio, never ever trust, you know, that type of stuff. And also taking shots at politicians in the song as well, because you know, that's the reality. So yeah. I'm looking at the overall context of what's happening over here and also what's happening in the reality as well. Mm -hmm. and trying to piece all of those, um, those nuances together in order for it to make sense and also for the series to have that credibility as well. So for me, it was very, very important. And um, just in closing, um, from the music supervisors uh, um, aspect as well, I needed to get artists that are relevant as well, mm. you know, apart from what was on the wish list, because part of my argument was, guys, the people that I'm bringing to the table with the music, they are the most relevant artists, from the young ones to the established ones, and they all have something to say, and it all plays a very, very impo important part in terms of where we are culturally. So if you don't listen to the music, or you don't consider it, or we don't find ways to cross that bridge, mm. then we're gonna miss out on a huge opportunity. And the culture, the scene, musically, from the cars, everything, they are extremely finicky and picky as well. I mean, not everybody's a critic on social media these days. So if this doesn't <laughs> represent what's truly going on, of course, we know the, the social media critics are gonna come out in the numbers mm. and start bashing, you know, the project left, right, and center. Mm. And at the end of the day, for me was, I got my reputation I got my name linked to this and I had to make sure, you know, mm. that this gets represented to the best of our ability. Yeah, well, uh, when I heard that you were on, attached to the project, it was really exciting because I think it's all about pairing the right talent with the right project. And I think, Correct. you know, it's really uh, a proudly South African project that uh, this, you know, the way this was done, all the post was done here, everything was done here. And I think it wouldn't have been the same if it had been taken off our shores because I think we needed that local flavor to be ingrained in everything that we do. And uh, it's interesting hearing you talk about the Cape Flats and I never grew up on the Cape Flats, but I hung out there a lot in my youth uh, yeah. going out to Mitchell's Plain and out to Gross Park and it's got a particular sound and, and yeah. you know, it's got a different flavor. And I think, you know, just coming to you, Josh, uh, you know, touching on that, you know, having to be recording on set, what was that like capturing that flavor and that sound and the challenges uh, of working in Lavender Hill? There's nothing like it. <laughs> if you haven't been to the Cape Flats and you haven't been to Lavender Hill or Mitchell's Plain, my grandmother's from Bonteville, I, I tell you, you, if you're there for longer than five hours, you do not know the difference between day and night. There are mm. kids everywhere, there's commotion in every corner, and your MSP is not a swear word, uh, what, from <laughs> what I've learned, <laughs> shooting in Avondale. <laughs> MSP is like, hello. <laughs> so uh. that, was, that was a big challenge. And the, just the, we did spinners and we shot the whole project through. And I was like, cool, I'm done. And you know, got mm. a phone call from you guys. And like, you need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll enjoy it. 
took a camping chair with, took up my rig, and I just spent the day in Lavendale just recording ambience, mm -hmm. just soaking up what I recorded, getting the kids playing, getting the arguments, getting the kids running around with boom boxes, mm. getting all the textures of everything, getting conversation. I think I had rolled easy for about six or seven hours on that day. Mm. Wow. And I just recorded and recorded conversation, people walking by, people discussing what they're cooking for dinner, what they're going to drink later, what drugs they're going to buy later. <laughs> Lekker. <laughs> there was just, if you haven't been there, it's an experience and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, touching on that, like, going back, I mean, it was really great. Um, Stephen, who was the post supervisor working with us uh, at Pressure Cooker and managed to motivate to production, that extra time for you to go back because it is such a unique landscape. Um, I mean, just it's something that we're taking forward into future productions is having a second unit audio team. We're actually currently doing it on a project now to capture those authentic location sounds because you can't find that in a library. And I guess maybe just touching on a little bit of like how would you do diff things differently going forward um, and maybe just a couple of those unique sounds because I think like the spinning for us was, yeah. you know, spinning is so unique it's to so unique. us. It's not like drifting. It's a, it's a completely different, you know, sound. And the cars are so different yes. as well. And maybe just you could touch so on recording those. The <coughs> I, f I just feel like if, you, if you're going forward, if we had to do season two of spinners, I would say sound needs... <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers, trust, fingers crossed. <laughs> we need at least, sound department needs at least two weeks. Ma minimum a week, maximum two weeks, just to fill the, fill the presence of what's missing. Mm. Let camera and let every other department do what they need to, and let sound play with a rough offline edit, just to match. Um, there were quite a bit of scenes in, in Spinners where I felt like we could have gotten that, just that little bit extra mm. if we just had more time to play. Mm. Um, the spinning, if we got the raw audio of the spinning with, guy, with, a, with boom operators standing on the pitch and not, not necessarily shooting for camera, but shooting or just recording for sound. Yeah. I feel like we could have gotten all the rubber in our faces and get, get the, just get that real texture, you know? Yeah. Um, we did as much as possible. We stuck microphones on the side of spinning cars. We stuck microphones inside spinning cars as well. Right. Um, we even used my vehicle to chase vehicles and rig up the audio to follow and chase vehicles so that we can just be there, get, just get as much as possible. So um, in the future, I'd say a week, two weeks max, we make up a list and from there we can take up what, what needs to be covered. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Can, can I just intercept sure. on this point right now? Yeah. I think that was a really good call to make, to make up these cars, because a lot of the culture is based on the sound of the cars as well, because mm. when you're spinning, for people that don't quite know what spinning is all about, these guys and these ladies are spinning and throwing these cars all over the place, but there's a very distinctive sound that a spin car makes because you're in the rev, rev, lim uh, rev limit all the time. Mm. And when the car's hitting the, re the revs and it's climbing over there, it's like people know the culture and those kids know mm that sound and that sound really gets people very very excited mm. especially when it's the e30 um uh, bmw you know they call it the gusheshe elsewhere in the country down here we call it the boxy say so but the boxy or the 1j or the 2j engine they're very very distinctive but if you're able to eat it in the limiter that's also what kind of um gets the authenticity right of what mm. all of this is about so that engine that is speaking in the limiter that always needs to to, to, to cut through so mm. when you're on the other end looking at that or you come from the community that's fully aware you're able to f you know you're you're, mm. you, you're able to connect with it emotionally as well so i think mm. that was a brilliant call to make Come, yeah. coming thing back to ready um so a week after shoot um when i had to do all the pickups so I, had, I had a car spinning in front of my driveway <laughs> in front of my house <laughs> neighbors must have loved Neighb that <laughs> I, I, I own the neighbors already it's in a very quiet major re residential area opposite the old age home <laughs> i told them I said, told everybody there's a there's a racing car i didn't say a spin car i just said there's a racing car coming out parking in my driveway and i need to record the car starting revving and there's, there's just a bit of sound effects I need to do. Mm. I, think, I think I had to finish my recording <laughs> within like three or four minutes. So I'm also into car building. 
<laughs> and I'm a big Subaru person, so I've got like four of these cars and a motorbike, and so I'm always revving them, taking the engine out, building it as well. And my neighbors loved me for this. Mm. <laughs> Eventually, I took the spinning car down the hill, and I spun somewhere up, I think it was in Tukai somewhere. <laughs> somewhere in Tukai, very far from everyone. And Empty parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Nice. Very fun experience. Okay. I must say, spinners is one of the greatest jobs I've ever done. Awesome. Um, awesome. Um, um, when I watch whatever I've done, I just, uh, I get that feeling, you know? I get that sinking feeling that this is going to be, this is, this is the shit, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. Um, Kyle, I mean, while we're on these location recordings, I mean, how do these recordings help elevate the storytelling in post and really add to that authenticity? Yeah, I mean, like Brady D said, these, these cars are unique. I mean, the closest sports that you could possibly think is, is drifting. But if you think of the sound, it's totally different. So it was very valuable to have that authentic sound from you know, the, the, the second unit stuff from mm. the, sh the shoot day, because the people that are gonna watch the show and be interested in the show, first of all, they, they're gonna, they've already gone to these events. They know what their sounds like. Mm. They know what the environment sounds like. So if, you, if you're not being authentic to that culture and that immersion of that space, people are going to immediately detract. So it was really important that we got that authenticity from mm. those cars. I mean, these, they, they look like normal cars, but they strip the interior. So when, you, when, you, when the camera goes inside the car, you can still, you f it feels like you're in the engine bay. There's metal moving. There's tires you know, burning. They, the tires pop and then mm. they're riding on the rim, so it's getting that off. That you, can't, you can't find that by searching on a, on a, on a sound library. Mm. So yeah, getting it right at the source really took us 90% of the way there and then allowed us to just take that last 10% and sound design and really just elevate it with certain elements. Mm. I think just touching to that, because we, you know, it's, it's, it's really got to be authentic, especially for a local audience. You know, it's got to be true for a local audience, but it's also got to have a wider international appeal. And it was funny when uh, we went to go watch it last night, we watched the uh, screening that they had at the waterfront, and it uh, reminded me um, that separation of Amber, one of the lead characters, how when her car enters the, 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 the show for the first time in the first episode, um, how it's got a hero feel to it, you know, it's, 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 and, and, and I actually forgot about it, you know, it's been a while since we've seen it, and it's like, oh, wow, it, it like, you, you feel that, and the, most people that watch it wouldn't notice it, it's a subliminal thing. Maybe just touch on, like, what, what, what is done there to separate her car, you know, from the, the cars to, to elevate it and give it that hero feel. So I think that was, when we added those extra elements of sound design, in certain, I mean, she does that. She does that like handbrake thing, where she mm. um, gets out of the car and all that kind of stuff. So it's elevating those moments of sound design, um, but it's then bringing back the other cars to give it, give a certain car like Amber's car a a spotlight. So you sort of bring back the one car and you subliminally just give it that hero moment. Mm. Um, so I think I think the sound design, it, it, that little bit that we put on top, is what gave it that extra just that little extra hero moment. Yeah, okay. And then in the mix, I mean, um, uh, the music that was synced, I feel, was quite fundamental to placing you in the location, really making you feel uh, the characters, that, like they're actually listening to this music. And I know a lot of it was uh, how you mixed it between diegetic and non-diegetic music. Um, just for people that don't know, diegetic is like, or, and non-diegetic is from, what you're hearing actually in a space, like on a car's radio or something, to it being more score and just in the soundtrack. And I think, how did you use that uh, from a mixing perspective to add to the authenticity of the show and like help elevate the emotional storytelling? Just in terms of the sync music? Yeah, of the sync music and how you did those crossovers. I mean, yeah. yeah so we, we definitely tried to um, bring that, that elevation in that the people that live in these communities listen to the music that's, that's, being, that's going from diegetic to non-diegetic. So the only way to tell the, the viewer that these people are listening to this music is you transition from, um, there'll be a person, you'll enter a scene and it'll be non-diegetic and then it's sort of a character will walk past a store or walk past a car or someone with a boombox and you just sort of like 
transition that and that uh, that subliminally tells people that are watching the show that this music that you are listening to, the people in the show, characters in the show are mm. also listening to it. So it then also brought that authenticity to the music and 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 bringing those worlds together. Okay, awesome, awesome. I mean, I think most people know here that this show was the first African series that was selected for can series and competition, which is incredible. Um, I guess I wanted to ask each of you, what do you feel made it stand out as a show, you know, from each of your perspectives? Maybe ready to, you wanna? Yeah, sure. I think one of the things that made the series stand out, um, it, it's just the overall story. Mm. And cars in the mainstream, mm. youth culture have never been exposed the way that this story actually exposes that as well. And I think the the cast are majority, or should I say the, the, the key characters are all young people as well. So it's kind of, um, how do you say, it's, for me personally, I think it's quite, um, it's cutting edge and pioneering on so many different ways and levels as well. And in terms of what the Cape Town City specifically, the Cape Flats have to offer, mm. I think movies, series, documentaries have barely scratched the surface as well. So there's so much more to unpack. And this is kind of like a gateway into that world as yeah. well. And it just goes to show how broad culture is and how it's constantly evolving. It's a very different South African, African story as well. Mm. If, you, if you wanted to, you could actually dig much deeper down into it as well because there's a very strong um, social context to it as well. There's a very strong political, mm. uh, economic context linked to all of this as well. And if you look at spinning, it's, it's practically a form of defiance as well. You know, spinners are always in trouble with the law mm. all the time. The way you drive a spinning car, it's everything that you're not supposed to do in a car. Yeah. The driver jumps out of the driver's seat, <laughs> he or she is hanging out of the door, she's standing outside the car while the car is spinning, that she jumps on top of the car, opens up the bonnet, standing inside the bonnet where there's such a lot of moving parts. For those that don't understand, it's complete madness, it's chaos. And there's so many people that criticize that. And in the framework of motorsport, it's still something that is seen as being reserved for the elitist and what's happening on the grassroots. These are kids and community members that's going, we can't get access to the tracks. The city hasn't got a, a dedicated space to us, so we're gonna spin. We'll take it to the streets, we'll take it here, we'll take it there. Mm. So it's just defiance, defiance, defiance. Mm. And this is a generation of young people that's even more defined these days as well because there's way more spinning cars and the drivers are becoming younger mm. and it's all linked to a culture so the music um the fashion the swag the cars the dialect the evolution of the dialect and the evolution of youth movements in cape town city specifically it's all linked to the culture and i think all of those dynamics combined makes it very very attractive i think to a global um market as well mm. Fast and the Furious is anything to go on. I just thought of that now, and it feels like the, the South African, you know, spin on that. Excuse the pun. Uh, do you guys have anything to add on that? I think. Um, is this mic working? I think that everyone watching the show can identify with one or two characters. Mm. And you can you can sort of be like, I feel that way. I felt that way, and it's bringing. It's. It's seeing someone in a different world and being able to connect with them and humanize with them and sort of be able to be immersed in that story. Be like, cool, I, I have sort of felt that way. I've been in a similar situation. Hmm. So I think that's what made it appealing to an international audience. Okay. Anything from your side, Josh? Um, so when, 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 when we were shooting the project, I, um, of course, uh, all, all my stuff was wireless. And um, I asked my technician in my boom off in between takes, do you think the story should have been like this or like that? You know, should we make the underdog? They should have made the underdogs like this and that. But then I think I viewed a session at your studio and I said, it's perfect. Mm. The, the, the show is perfect the way it is. It shouldn't, it shouldn't change at all. Because mm. the idea where, where I thought is, should spinners be more of a comedic side, but then when I watched the bit in post, I saw there, there's a bit of everything. There, 
it's, it's, what, it's what fulfills the picture. You know, you, you want a bit of skopskit and dawner, a bit of laughter, <laughs> a bit of love, a bit of action, a bit mm. of spinning cars. Yeah. This is what spinners is. Yeah. Yeah. Full package. Full package. Yeah. Okay. Wouldn't give it a full quadrant uh, label because it's not for kids. But uh, yeah, other than not, that, not it's, it's, it's got not. it's got heart and it's yeah. got family and it's it's a great it's got story. Culture. Yeah. That's the main part. Yeah. So exactly. It brings out the, the the spinning culture. Yeah. And you need you need a story to to fall, to fall back on. Mm. Where that's where I'm not going to get into the story, yeah. but that's where we see in Ethan. Yeah. Comes out of the out of the bad side, follows in his father's footsteps to get to the good side of spinning. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, just touching back onto like as South Africans doing this, you know, there's been a big push from everyone just about how this is a proudly South African production. I mean, when we chatted last, just about I think from your side, syncing the music, uh, um, how fundamental it was that it was you trying to get these tracks. You know, that it wasn't some international publisher or music supervisor coming in. It was you, and because of who you were. You were able to get a lot of, uh, you know, credibility with the the musicians and all that sort of stuff. How important do you feel it was that South Africans were working on the show and were uh, driving the narrative of what what was right for the show? Sure, I think it's quite groundbreaking though. Um, there's so many artists that a lot of people do not know about. Once again, on certain tiers of society. Yeah. Although they exist, where in that world they really count though. So just to, to, to enable them to get that uh, another level of exposure, it's very important. And this series are doing that for so many artists, so many talented people out there as well. And once again, you know, just to get back to your question, it's very, very important for the music to be authentic. Mm. And to a certain degree, it's extremely challenging as well because it's a story that was filmed in Cape Town City on the Cape Flats. And to get that right, you have to understand the culture and you have to understand the history as well. Mm. And there's so many different genres and styles of music that's quite popular that makes the community tick, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So I've been explaining to the guys in the WhatsApp group as well because we were going back and forth on certain songs and styles and all these things. And at certain points I had to make them understand this music that you're asking for, it's cool. I get it, I'm down with it, I love it. If it was for me in my personal space and for me and my small group of homies that are into this vibe, cool. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not what people are listening to on the Cape Flats. Mm. The Cape Flats is listening to Ama Piano and the staple of the Cape Flats is yacht music. Mm. And then if you look at yacht music and it's hip hop music, and then we have a huge community that's into dancehall and reggae music as well. So that's what's happening in the spinning round. So if you try to push your creative agenda, that could potentially go over people's heads and you might be missing, you know, um, the opportunity for people to truly um, connect with uh, yeah. the, the story you're trying to get across as well. And for me, being able to find the correct artists that will sync with the scenes, that was the one thing. And on the other end, when I went into production mode, I kind of had to, um, discipline myself and also to a certain degree I had to pull myself back and go DJ Ready D you can't get too nerdy you can't get too technical on the production and remember a lot of the music that gets released and the songs that bangs are songs that are all released on like low res low quality mm. low fi um, textures as well so if you're going to produce a certain song and you're going to go into the full digital recording studio mode and you're going to get everything mixed down and the, the sounds are panning this way and that way and it's beautiful from that standpoint. But that can make or break a song as well, you know, because we're living in a very different age as well. Not to say that every song had to be like that, but there's certain songs and genres that you had to be careful of. Yeah. You know, this is probably the way it's going to sound in a taxi or somebody's boombox or through somebody's phone. Yeah. So try and get that sound as close as what that kid would have rifted or the way they would share it from WhatsApp groups to WhatsApp groups or whatever. Yeah. So you need, just from a sonic standpoint, I had to kind of go back and um, decrease the quality of the songs of all as well. And to a certain extent also be destructive with the mix as well. Maybe the voice is a little bit high, maybe this is clashing with that. But then again, within the culture where people are musically, it, it exists. Yeah. And you know, you have to take all those little nuances. You need to be conscious of that as well. 
Uh, it's funny how lower quality actually sometimes means more authenticity because Correct. I remember like first time doing a um track yes. and it's like, why are the vocals not sounding right? Oh, because they're not recorded for, through a phone on WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, it's Correct. interesting thinking about those sorts of things and that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've lost my train of thought there. Um, I thought there was a question that was going around there. But um, I guess, you know, just we're sort of running up to the end here, but I guess going uh, into the future now, maybe just starting with you, Carl, like biggest learnings from this project that you're taking forward into the future on collaboration or on how, how to do things better and collaborating across the board? I think there's a, a, a big focus that as a pressure cooker would like to, that we're trying to push in the industry is getting in early, getting in the pre-production, because the, the earlier you speak to the location guy or um, going to visit on sets or spending a day on sets. You, mm. when, when, when it comes to the studio and you've been there, then, you, then you've been immersed in the culture, you've been immersed in the scene and all that kind of stuff. So I feel there's a massive, having, second, having, having a second unit while, you know, like Josh knows, you're too busy concentrating on the scene. You can't go and record ambiences. Mm. And when you're in that environment, that, that it sounds different when there's a film crew there. Yeah. It's just you and your, and your setup, then it's more authentic to how that sound is gonna be. So getting in early, speaking to people, um, asking about stories, hearing it for yourself. Mm. Then when it comes to us at the end of the line, it makes our job a lot easier. You, don't, you have to do less fixing in post. Um, more elevating. And then you can be, it, it, it's, yeah, you can elevate it and you can be more creative. Mm. If you spend lots of time fixing things, you, then you can't be creative and then take it to that next level. Okay. Josh? Biggest learnings? I forgot your question. Don't go into Lavender Hill alone. Go with full security. <laughs> <laughs> full security and just prepare yourself <coughs> for, for the worst things. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I agree with Carl. Um, I'd say just plan and plot. If we had to go forward on this job, um, or, or if we had to do season two, cross fingers, um, I'd say we'd have to plan and plot. Know which vehicles, in engine-wise, we need to know which engines we are using, what vehicles we are using, and just record that ahead of time. If it's sort of situation, follow the car choreography in the stunt movements on the pitch as well. Yeah. Record that in the choreography session, bring it to post, and so that there is something to work with beforehand. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Mr. D. Sure, I'm hoping for season two, three, four, five, maybe up until the 20, so we can get a nice lifelong series going out there. Um, Fast yeah. and Furious, anything to go by, we might have 10, eh? Yeah, yeah absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now, I think it's definitely a dream come true. It's also um, the type, you know, the, the characters, the stories, there's so much room for, um, for you know, to, 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 to give the story or the culture legs as well. There's so many different directions that we can take it into. Mm. But I also think, you know, I'll, I'll definitely latch on to what they have to say as well. A much longer running time as well to, to be able to prep. Mm. I think that is extremely important. And then of course, it's just the, the technicalities and the administrative and the nitty gritty conversations. You know, we have to have a little bit more serious conversation around those aspects as well because you need quite a bit of resources to make certain things happy uh, happen as well mm. and um, yeah I think in the in, in, in probably in the ideal scenario all of us would want everything to be 100% correct but what this experience have taught us you know that you always have to be prepared for the unknown as well mm. and also because you're working in such a, um, a high impact um, environment as well with cars yeah things are spinning the stunts is probably the most authentic stunts the people in the actual um, series they are not if you want to call it trained or professional stunt people it's the actual people doing these things every single weekend mm. so it's being able to, to to have the opportunity just to 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 to, to have a, a much much more longer leading and running time mm. and just to be more clear in terms of the direction from a music standpoint as well mm. so that things don't jump up on you constantly and you're being hit with surprises as well mm. and uh, for me in terms of who i am and my career and where i am right now the ideal scenario once again if the if you're selected to play a certain role i would love 
for all my attention and my energy to be focused on that only. Yeah. But you know, we're living in a time and an era where you have to find different types of projects, so we're all busy with different types of things to make sure that we put that bread on the table at the end of the day. Yeah. But I mean, that is just me thinking in the ideal scenario. But other than that, I'm sure um, I'm yet to see, you know, uh, parts of the series. I only saw like the little pre-production aspects and the raw cuts. I missed out on so much because of travel. And I'm sure, you know, if the opportunity comes to do this again, everything will definitely be am amplified and mm. it will be improved on. And I'm super excited to see the outcomes down the line. Mm. Uh, I mean, like I'm hearing uh, just a lot of more time more Absolutely. time you know time, there, time's everything. There, yeah there's never yeah. enough time with these things but i think it's good i think one of the solves for time is communication you know like everybody sort of having an open line of communication and talking and yeah it's funny how a half an hour conversation i think you know kyle chatting to you you know before here's what we need from set can help save a whole bunch of uh, time down the line and i guess everybody just communicating well is really important and i mean just touching on uh, that, I mean, uh, have you, is there anything in the pipeline? What's next for you? Anything in production or anything in TV or film or anything yeah. like that? In, in production, there's a few few things that we're busy <coughs> brainstorming at the moment. Um, part of the mission is to um, kind of tap into my life story as well, because there's a lot of other things that come right. with that story. Um, that That's hovering at the moment, and there's a lot of work um, from a DJing standpoint that's happening as well. Okay. I do work in the radio and on the yep. other end of what we do, the other, the other half of my life is a non-profit organization and we use drifting and spinning in, um, you know, in youth development and road safety programs. So we're quite busy in that aspect. And we also um, work with a lot of young people that come from impoverished communities to try and assist in that realm as well. So cars and all these things have been central to getting the youth excited about these programs, especially within the road safety arena as well. Then there's all these events coming up. We have a huge one coming up on the 24th of this month on the Grand Parade. It's probably one of the biggest events to hit Cape Town City. Um, so we all, yeah, we're getting up to all of those. And then other than that, it's all the-, the All motorheads, eh? <laughs> I just realized now, like thinking about it, Carl's a biker, you've got all your cars and bikes and you're also in spinning, it's yeah, all motorheads. Definitely. So hopefully we can get an AI uh, operated car <laughs> bolt with pegs in it. We can spin it, I can scratch and we can, yeah, shoot a, a dope little documentary around it or something. Yeah, tech and cars and doing crazy stuff. Yeah, I think that will be awesome. Awesome. And we can throw some zombies in there, we can throw some really cool <laughs> stuff in there, yeah. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. I, I think we've got about two minutes left. I'm not sure if anybody's, uh, are we, we're done. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your time, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. No um, and the show will be, I think, premiering in November yeah. um, yeah. on Showmax. So get it then. Get your adrenaline. Awesome. Thank you, All ladies right. and gentlemen. Thanks, everyone.